Welcome to the Hank Cisco, to the Hank Cisco, to the Hank, Hank Cisco, Hank Cisco Show. Ladies and gentlemen, please don't touch that dial. I have a special guest today. This is how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. Manja, manja. Okay. Go to right, you got to throw the shoulder around with you. Right? Okay, thank you, and God bless each and every Ladies one. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Hank Cisco Show. Let's go. I'm your host, Barbara Ann Zippy, executive producer with Jow Bell Living Italian Style, and proud to share my next guest with you today, Joe Amorosa, co-owner of Pennsylvania Distillery Company. Welcome to the Hank Cisco Show, Joe. Barbara, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and meet you, and, and your business is fascinating. But first, so is your last name. Joe Amorosa, to anybody that goes in, any or the Amorosa name to anybody that goes grocery shopping in the bread department right. or has grown up in South Philadelphia no matter whether you're in Norristown, Philly, Chester County, down the shore you see that Amoroso bag so you got to solve that mystery for us. Well uh, I can do that uh, very easily a lot of people uh, to this point in time with the exception of the people that I've already spoken told this story to uh, are not aware of the fact that once upon a time there was two Amoroso baking companies. Wow. The Amoroso Baking Company of today and my grandfather. Uh, the two companies, the Amoroso Baking Company of today used to be at 65th and Hereford Avenue in West Philly and my grandfather was at 64th and Vine. They were literally about two miles apart. Right. Um, my grandfather woke my father up uh, six days a week at one o'clock in the morning. He got my father out of bed. He made him bake the bread. He made him bag the bread. He made him deliver the <gasps> bread. And when he got done doing that, he made him work in the store. So my father did this six days a week. And when he came, and I know this is real, uh, I was probably seven or eight or nine years old at the time. I was in both of these bakeries without a doubt. And um, uh, when I used to go to where my father worked, I used to go and hide, and my grandmother would come and find me and then take me across the street and buy me a Dixie cup, and I would have ice cream, and then I'd go home. But anyhow, when it came time for my grandfather to retire, he asked my father if he wanted to take over, and my father said, absolutely not. Right. So my father ended up working for the other Amoroso Baking Company, my grandfather's cousins, and that's where he worked the rest of his life. He worked there, but... Uh, and you're still, so you definitely have a family connection to that bag and proud of it, I'm sure, yeah, when you see yep, that name. Yep, uh, and I am a bread fan as it is, so uh, I love cheese steaks, and as long as I get a decent uh, roll, roll uh, I'll... Isn't that the uh, secret, though, Joe? That's it. If the roll is in it, if the roll's no good, the cheese steak isn't any good, and neither is a hoagie, so uh, the roll has to be cooked, and without that, it's just not worth it. I, I, I'll go to we'll where... We'll save the calories. I have my favorite place in a couple of places where I go and I get a cheesesteak. And uh, right now I haven't had any for a while only because I'm on a diet and I can't have any bread. <laughs> well, so, uh, well, for an Italian, <laughs> yeah. we have food and we have um, usually food and wine, yep. right? That yep. are staples in the Italian household. And you've taken the wine as a second career and into a completely different venture, which is how we met. Mm -hmm. And you and your partner, you have to tell us about your partner and your relationship, opened a, a distillery in Malvern. We did. My, my partner is also my brother-in-law, so I've probably known him for probably 45 years. And Richard? Richard Bioni is his name, and uh, we're brother-in-laws. I married his sister. Um, we... Uh, you each had separate careers, right? Yeah, we did have separate careers. Uh, in my previous life, I had nothing to do with this business. I, I was a print salesman for a large corporation uh, that uh, had companies across the world. And my partner, Richard, he ended up um, traveling the world telling Fortune 100 companies how to run their business. 
He has uh, three degrees, one in Drexel, one at Villanova, and one in Wharton. So he's pretty well versed in uh, how to run a company and that kind of deal. Um, so you, you and your brother-in-law actually took Pennsylvania, created Pennsylvania distilleries, right. and said to yourselves, after you both retired, this is what we're going to do for our next act. Well, actually, it didn't kind of happen like that. Okay. Uh, he he retired, and I retired, and I can go regress a little bit. Back in 1996, he was very close to opening a brew pub, and all the um, all the things were in place to do the brew pub, and at the last minute, um, the person that was going to run the brew pub bailed on him, so that whole thing failed. And at that point in time, he pro he promised himself that he would get back on that, either as a brew pub or a distillery. But the brew pubs in the last 30 years have gone up, right? And they continue to grow up. It's like a pizza joint. Neither one of them go out of business if. If anything if goes out of business, right. somebody sold it. So now the distilleries are on this same track and they're just starting to climb. Okay, and, and Pennsylvania is a liquor state store controlled yep. state. Yes, it is. So when did all this opportunity happen to be able to open your own private whiskey distillery? Well, uh, Rich was doing the research on this and uh, we started back in November of 2015 and uh, we finally opened the doors in August of 2018. But with the, the two and a half years prior to that, there was a tremendous amount of research that was done. Uh, Rich put together a business plan. There was a lot of visiting other distilleries in the state and other breweries in the state to see how people were doing things. Uh, but it wasn't done without a lot of research. So how do you decide what your products are? Well. Um, Rich, Rich pretty much decides which products are next and which ones we're doing. And what was your initial one? The initial one is the vodka, the gin, and the rum. They were the, in, well, okay, so I take this that was back. the vodka. Actually, uh, the white whiskey was one of the original products. Oh, interesting. Only because um, we tried to buy an aged whiskey so we can open the doors with an aged whiskey, but the state would not allow us to do that. So we ended up opening with a white whiskey, and that whiskey and uh, vodka and gin were the three products that we opened the door with. And as time went on, we added the aged whiskey, which had to sit in barrels for almost a year, and the bourbon, which also has sit in the barrels for almost a year. But I have an interesting story about how we came to the bourbon name. How did but, you? Uh, uh, What's the name of the bourbon? The name of the bourbon is Dewey's Number no. 69 Small okay. Batch Bourbon. Okay. My father-in-law, Rich's father, his name is DeWilio, and they've called him Dewey all his life. So one particular Friday, he stops up, okay. and it was the Friday right before Thanksgiving. That's this one. Yeah, that's this product right here. Mm -hmm. And it was right before Thanksgiving, and he stops in, and he wants to place an order for his Christmas gifts, and there's a certain amount of people that he gives bottles to. So of course he comes up and we, we were there, but I didn't know he was coming and he's banging on the door, but we never heard him and we never knew, never saw him. So my wife, his daughter was taking him and his, his wife out to dinner, at lunch that afternoon, and he says to my wife, hey, those guys aren't working up there. I went up there, banged on the door, nobody opened the door, there's nobody there, they're not working. My wife says, yeah, Joe's there, I just got done talking to him on the phone. He says, okay, well, can you ask Joe to give me a call tomorrow, which was Saturday. I say, okay, I'll call him. So on Saturday, he calls me and he places an order for three bottles that he wants to give away. And um, I hang up the phone and I'm laughing. And my wife says, why are you laughing? And I said, because if these bottles come in on Monday, he's not getting his order. He's going to get the bottles with his name on it. So lo and behold, the bottles come in on Monday. Rich and I had the line set up and we started bottling some bourbon. Well, that night, Rich and I took him a case of bourbon. And to see the look on his face was absolutely priceless to see his name on the bottle. How and cool. he knew we were making bourbon, but he had no idea that it was being named after, after him. him. 
But the real interesting part of the story is that he looked at me after and he said, Joe, where's my order? <laughs> and I said, you're not getting your order. You're going to give away the bottles with your name on it. Oh, how cool. And he says, yeah, okay, I guess I can do that. So, how cool is that? Yeah, he's, he's 83 and um, he still has all his marbles, but to see... Uh, the look on his face. To see the look on his face was priceless and, and I wish I had a video of it. And that's a nice thing to be able to do at, and with, this, with the second life business that you guys are entering yep. into. Well, you know, there's got to be a big process from deciding you're going to um, distill and make whiskey mm -hmm. and getting on the shelves of the Pennsylvania State Stores. You are in State Stores, right? We are right? in 15 Fine Wine and Good Spirit Store. Now, we're on what they call their um, pilot program. Okay. Um, they put us in X amount of stores, and what I need to do and I, what I'm doing on a fairly regular basis is I go into the 15 different stores that we're in, I sign up for two hour tasting events and I can go in and I set up the bottles and anybody that wants to taste, it can taste it. So in other words, if they see our bottle on the shelf and they might be interested in purchasing the bottle, I can offer them a taste right there. Right. So that's something that uh, I can do on a every day, every week basis, as long as I set it up 30 days ahead of time. But in, in the course of history of state stores in the state of Pennsylvania, right. this, you know, your normal whiskeys that are on the shelf came from major manufacturers. Right. Am I correct? You're right. You're right. So how this seems like a new explosion for uh, of an industry for private people to actually get into the liquor business, like George Clooney yeah. is in the liquor business, right? And uh, Cindy Crawford's husband, I believe, has some kind of uh, uh, liquor uh, mm -hmm. that they manufacture. Tom Hanks maybe has something in his skull. Now, they're I, big movie stars. Barbara, I, I can tell you this much. Rich and I love the products that we make. And I think and I believe the only difference between our products and their products is the fact that they have millions of dollars to spend on advertising and right now we do not. But that's what amazes me about small business in 2020 mm -hmm. because you came from a big business background as a printing rep and mm -hmm. you know big budgets and you know what went into things years ago before computers. Today social media can drive your reputation that's right. without a major budget right. and and what if I find fascinating is that Pennsylvania with these crafters for uh, brewing, with the distilleries, with the liqueurs, they're actually giving small business people an opportunity to jump in the market. There is. There's, uh, Pennsylvania is one of 18 control states in the United States. Um, it, it's a little it's a little bit of a problem to get around the three-tier system it, it's very difficult but you to did. maneuver but we're doing it and in tr well, how long of a time have you been in business uh actually uh, 18 months that's it and we're 18 months in 15 state stores already that's a big and, accomplishment joe and, and we're also we're also in about 35 um uh, restaurants and bars in the uh, area between King of Prussia, the airport, uh, Malvern. Oh, so you could go into your local restaurant that has a Absolutely. bar and say you want a vodka specifically associated with... And you can ask for you. our whiskey in, in, in a lot of these different places, and uh, yes. That's cool. Um, there's several restaurants, uh, General Warren Inn, for example, okay. that has our products on their menu. Uh, Stingers down by the airport, they also do. Uh, Bomba Tacos, a brand new place that opened up in Malvern. Right. They have three of our products uh, as staples on the shelf, and they have cocktails with actually, just our products on them right now. Okay, actually, we didn't talk about where your distillery is because you are open some nights for your own private tasting. That's right. We have our own tasting room. Uh, we're open four nights a week. We're open Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And uh, one of the unique characteristics uh, of our place is that um, uh, everything is made from scratch at our, at our uh, tasting room. Uh, not only are all the products made from scratch, but the cordials and the bitters and the juices are all made pretty much on a daily basis every day um, right there at the distillery. 
things I, when that I, people can't duplicate because our our spirits and our cocktails people there's more and more people coming in that from word of mouth get to find out who we are and other people are telling them how good the cocktails are to enjoy is, the taste is, uh, yeah when i stopped by that day to and got to meet you guys you actually can see your where where you're brewing yeah it's the whole walls are glass that's right and it's just fabulous to see it in action besides enjoying it you know you could see it and it's all right in front of their eyes yeah part of the plan was there was no reason to hide it we wanted people to see it it's uh it's a lot nicer to look at than a brewery a brewery doesn't have the copper that's involved in what we need for the distilling process right so oh it sparkles it, it that sparkles. room sparkles through the glass it does i have to it say does. that it does. now you mentioned to me something that sounded exciting and that's chicago yeah. now how is chicago playing into your future well we uh are right now um, all the paperwork is just about done for that and uh, i'm waiting to get a final order from them but they're going to start placing our product out in chicago and uh, that'll be happening probably within the next couple of weeks now is so. that a private st or a controlled state uh no it, it's um, it's it's a private state but one of the interesting things you're talking about control states pennsylvania has a lot of its a lot of rules and regulations around it but there's one thing that they do have and that our license allows us to have five locations under the same license without costing another dime so the distillery will always be in malvern but we're allowed to have five other restaurants and bars in anywhere in the state of pennsylvania right so that's something that we can do as well and that they that well it seems like pennsylvania is accommodating the new craft industry that's building up around that and yeah. embracing the small business owner without uh um, what do they call that uh, making them independent stores yeah. to still keep the state control yeah. system uh, the, the other thing i did mention is we're allowed to make a hundred thousand proof gallons a year and they just recently approved us staying open from 11 o'clock at night till 12. So by 12 o'clock, we have to close, but we have our limitations. But you know what? After 11, 11 o'clock is more than enough for us right now. People are out of there by 1030. I mean, and that's pretty reasonable. Yeah. I mean, we are talking about liquor. Uh -huh. And so we all are, do have to talk about being responsible consumers, right. you know, and designated drivers. Right. Uh, Uber always, Uber's lifts yeah. and, and all that. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, people do, if you're going to party, you do need to uh, do it reasonably. You need to do it reasonably. And, and after two or three cocktails, pretty much, I mean, that's more than enough for a lot of people. Sure. So oh, put me under the table. <laughs> so, yeah, after a couple of those cocktails, that's more than enough. Right. So, uh, at 10, <clears throat> 10, 10, 30, 11 o'clock. That's more than enough at this point in time for uh, but people go home because they're all well aware of not wanting to drive drunk. So right. there's either an Uber driver picking somebody up or somebody else, a family member is picking up the people. So uh, nobody leaves their uh, intoxicated without some means of getting home. Right, right. And, yeah. that's, and that's a good philosophy right. uh, to have because your place is beautiful. It's, it's, not, it's very nice. Um, one of the things that um, is interesting is your label. Can you tell ah. us about your label? Yeah. Because it's, um, it's, it's an interesting our li concept. Our labels, our labels are kind of interesting. If you look at the outside of the bottle, people like our labels, but mm -hmm. what they really don't get to know, unless I sit down and show most of them, is that it's actually an outline of the state of Pennsylvania wrapped around the bottle. It is. So, you know, you have Pittsburgh up here and you have Philadelphia down in here. It, it's a little bit and different. And this even looks like uh, the Frontier Back label even looks like one of those Pennsylvania symbols. Yeah, and in a sense. Actual, the actual name of this bottle is actually called the Philadelphia Flask. Is it really? No. Wow, a Philadelphia flask this big? Can you imagine taking that down Broad Street on Parade Day? The mayor yeah. would be having a would be having a fit. Yeah, <laughs> well, believe it or not, that's the name of this bottle, and they're called a Philadelphia flask. But um, recently, we've switched to this uh, bottle here, where uh -huh. we're silk screening it right on the on the bottle. Okay, as so, opposed to doing uh, the label. Yeah, the, the, I uh, see the difference. The bottles that have the labels on them are handled five times: once to fill them, once to cork them, 
wants to put this label on, the back label on, and then the shrink wrap the capsule. Right. So those bottles are handled five times. And right now, the labels are being put on by hand, basically by me and my partner, or one of us or both of us. We're putting the labels on the bottles. What an interesting business concept that, you, you know, you analyze how many times you have to hold that bottle sure. Sure. To, in the production and how it brings the cost per unit down. Well, right now, uh, we're four employees strong, and two of them are my brother-in-law and myself. <laughs> I know, so that makes it so, a really mom-and-pop operation, doesn't it? Or well, bro-and-bro operation. Up until about a month ago, it was only three of us. Right. So we hired another person to work with Rich in the back right now. And uh, that's kind of, you know, but that's all there is, is four people running around like nuts for the most part every yeah. day. Yeah, I love the color. Yeah. You know, the color of the whiskey. Is there a, a, something to the color and the... No, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the color ends up being based on the barrels and how the inside of the barrels are charred. So the Dewey's bourbon, the inside of the barrels are charred at a three, which means that they're burnt on the inside staves and the heads and the tail part of it. And the Liberty Rye, uh, the barrels are charred at a four. How about that? So for the most part, for all the people that really don't know, all this alcohol is actually, no matter what you make, it actually comes out white, clear. So the only time you end up with a colored version of it is when you put it in barrels. So that's the only difference uh, between, but everything does come out white. And for people that don't know, to make gin, you have to make vodka first. Really? So once you have vodka, then you end up, we, uh, we end up putting seven botanicals mm -hmm. in, our, in our gin so that the vodka is then converted to gin or we make gin from vodka. But a lot of people don't know that uh, you make vodka to make gin. So no, you don't. So you have over here. We have a small batch vodka, and why small batch? What do you mean? Small well, batch small vodka? batches. Uh, we are not the big guys on the block. Right. The big guys on the block. They make millions of gallons of this stuff a year. We're only allowed to make a hundred thousand proof gallons a year, which we're nowhere near to do that. Uh, but we only make it 300 gallons at a time. Gotcha. So that's why we're called a small batch uh, which is, distillery. Which and there's nothing wrong with that. No, that's it sounds actually fine. more, you, you know, more rare. Um, a white rye whiskey. We have a white rye whiskey. Then we have a rye whiskey. What do you have at that end? And we have our gin and we have our rum gin here. And this, a white rum. The, yeah. And with the exception of the rum, which you can't get any of the products right in this neck of the woods, all the other products, all the grain is sourced in Chester County. So everything that we use to, pr to produce these products is homegrown. Is homegrown in Chester County, Pennsylvania. So it's all, it's all local. That is amazing. That is amazing. What would you? There's, you know, a lot of. Uh, with the, we, we were saying with the craft beer industry being on the rise and now this distillery business being on the rise, um, there's opportunities out there for everybody. There's there plenty is. of room. What advice would you give, uh, uh, you know, s in someone that's thinking, you know, I might want to look into this? Well, uh, what advice would I give somebody? Do your homework ahead of time. Make sure you do the research. Um, have enough capital available to produce to get started uh, but take the time to do the research for example uh, we vetted 16 different companies uh, regarding our equipment and once we got it down to about three I mean at that point in time I said Rich has to be the guy to make that final decision uh, being his chemical engineer background and he understands all this stuff so actually chemical engineering is a major component yeah, a chemical is. engineer is, is a major is. component it to is. this uh, partnership R many years ago rich spent some time at mobile oil a, a fair amount of time growing up at mobile oil and working there so the distilleries or the um, the oil manufacturing at mobile oil those columns were similar to the columns you see at our place, except the columns in an oil refinery are significantly bigger and people can fit inside of them. So Rich spent 
uh, I think twice a year, or I'm not sure, I think it was a, what he called a turnaround. And he would actually be in those towers. Amazing. So he understands how they work from beginning to end. There's nothing he doesn't understand about them. So, uh, I mean, that's kind of, uh, uh, you need to know, you, you need to end up, um, you, you need to do a lot of research. And you need the right people to do the right jobs. And uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, what, what I wanted to finish telling you was we've edited it down to three, but we ended up buying it in Boise, Idaho. But um, there was a lot of research that went into the 16 different places that we talked to. Well, it doesn't sound like you're much retired anymore, to tell you the truth, Joe. Well, um, the long and short of it was, I mean, people asked me how I got into this, and I said, well, Rich wanted to make it, and I wanted to drink it. Uh, right. <laughs> but, but in reality, I, wanted, I didn't want to do nothing in retirement, and um, I ended up getting quite involved, and we pretty much spent six days a week doing this. So. Well, I think it's pretty fascinating what careers people over 50 are putting themselves into these days. And um, no matter what it is, trying to open your own distillery mm -hmm. or uh, trying to recreate your image. Uh, actually, I had the pleasure of filling in for Hank Sisko, you know, with a, a TV talk show to interview people like yep. you. Who knows what, what uh, is in store for us all the time. Yeah. Now, with your Italian roots, we're coming to an end. Um, a couple surefire questions. Um, sauce or gravy? Uh, gravy. Gravy. Yeah. Okay. And does your gravy have meat or not meat? Uh, when I was growing up, it did not. Okay. Uh, but now I prefer gravy. Uh, I prefer meat in the gravy when I go out to a restaurant. Okay. Okay. And what's your favorite uh, dish to eat? Raviolis. Oh, do you remember the homemade raviolis? At My the grandmother made them. And did you, were you the fork guy? Did you have to close those no, little ravioli edges? No, I watched, but I, I was the Batel guy. You were the Batel guy. Yeah, and when we got done making the Batels, uh, there wasn't a whole lot left because I ended up eating most of them on the way. But is it that the truth? Batels are my favorite. Raviolis are my favorite. And you know what? Uh, you get used to a certain kind of ravioli and a meatball. And sometimes you go out and get it, it's just not the same. No, it's not the same. So you kind of get spoiled growing up. I guess you might want to call it that, being spoiled when you grow up. But Sure, you do. But you can tell, always tell a good Italian restaurant if you see Italians there eating the spaghetti and meatballs. Yeah. And then you know that. It's, uh, you could judge it that way. Yeah. I really appreciate you being a guest, taking the time to come with us today to explain a fascinating new industry really that is developing in the state of Pennsylvania. It's on its way. It's going way up. There's plenty of room for more distillers at this point in time because in reality we're not taking business away from one another. We're taking it away from the large guys. Really that is the truth because this is an excellent opportunity for people to get in. There's so many, I mean in our culture, in our Italian culture, our parents or grandparents made limoncello which is taking on a new resurgence mm -hmm. today and they made Sambuca or mm -hmm. I'm sure they even made their moonshine and whiskey in the back <sighs> of the house at one point or another. Well, uh, I guess you've seen that show on TV, Moonshiners. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing has to be staged because otherwise that in reality that's not legal. Right, so, right, uh, right. It's pretty fascinating what they do but uh, I've seen some really uh, unbelievable stuff. I saw a, a watermelon whiskey uh, I actually saw them throw the watermelon in. It's just, it just some of the stuff they do is really off the wall. It is, but um, it's. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you. You're 15 stores in the state of Pennsylvania and growing. So our li listeners and viewers out there are going to have to look for Pennsylvania distilleries, pay them a visit in Malvern at their tasting room, or look for them on your shelf in, in their in your local um, state store, and maybe actually ask if you can um, have their vodka, gin, or whiskey at one of your favorite restaurants. Until we meet again, I'm Barbara Ann Zippy. Ciao, Bella. Mm -hmm.